next speaker was trained in the hideous profession of financial engineering um, and, uh, and then made an awakening and, and turned his research over to household finance. Um, has worked in academia, worked on Wall Street, worked with folks on Wall Street, um, and has created a nonprofit. And that's me. So, um, <laughs> and I have no bona fides to speak whatsoever. Um, so I want to kind of focus, and it's going to build very much off Charles's comments, on, on, on my challenges of thinking about this question as a dean and what it is, and maybe get your help about how to think about this. Um, so in my uh, kind of way of approaching this question of responsible leadership, I think of it at three levels. First is the individual, and the second is the organization, and the third is the, I don't know what the third part would be called, it would be the broader system. And a lot of what we deal with when we talk about responsible leadership is the first part of Charles's comments we're all about is thinking about individuals. Charles and Kim, it's really about individuals, individual behavior. Of course, that's the core of it all. Um, because to the extent that we want to, as schools, um, generate more and create more people who are going to be responsible leaders, of course, we need to get them to be thinking about what that means, to discuss these questions openly. Um, and Kim, I think, probably will talk a little bit about some of the things, or may talk about some of the things that he did at, at Harvard Business School in order to make that happen. Um, there is, however, this unfortunate nature versus nurture debate and the question of how much we can change personalities, especially personalities by the time they arrive here at a school at age 26, 29, 35, 42, whatever it might be. Um, there's also this fundamental, we, we heard some research, and, and some of the research on behavioral uh, aspects these days is quite clear and you don't need to do research. People's intentions are very different than their actions. And so it is true that we can get people sensitized in order to behave and think about certain ways and we might even get them to say they're going to do those things. But it's often very difficult to have them do them. And you can think about that in terms of dieting and controlling your finances and, in, and as well in, in terms of the other things that we all know we should do. Um, and you could come away from all that with a, with a dispirited sense of, well, if you can't change personalities so much, and if people are more well-intentioned than they are well-behaved, where does that leave us? Um, and I think it leaves us in the place where um, we have to do all that we can to have all of us talk about these issues. But as a business school, and as a dean of a business school, it brings me up one or two levels. The next level is not about individuals, but about organizations. And I will confess that I've been reading some stuff from a, some very good work done at NYU, so give credit where credit is too, about organizational design. How is it that you can create an organization whereby the rules in that organization and the design of that organization is more likely to re lead to responsibility as opposed to less likely to lead to responsibility? How do we create an organization that encourages people to make responsible choices, to hold them responsible for their choices, and reduce the number of situations where people are put into almost impossible choices? So we might not be able to change individuals that easily, but certainly as a business school, we should be thinking about how we change organizations. <coughs> Um, and so how is it that we might foster uh, some of this responsibility within the organizations that we help to lead? And I'll also give another confession. I'm an economist, um, and that confession is a confession, a financial economist. And despite the fact that I've spent my entire professional life as an economist and, and a financial economist, I find that economics in and of itself is problematic in this regard. Um, and in particular, I think about the world of finance and Wall Street where I've spent much of my life, or at least part of my life when I was not an academic. And why is it that, you know, in some sense, the value system that comes out of economics in some, in some ways is, is very dispiriting to the conversation that we're having? I think because it focuses only or primarily on economic gain rather than other consequences. Um, and, and any time you reduce a problem to a single dimension, often you, you find that you get the behaviors that, you in, that you're not hoping for, but that are unintended. It focuses only on one stakeholder. Um, I preached for many years, uh, shareholder value maximization, which, as an economist, and it makes the other shareholders and stakeholders seem unimportant. 
It focuses on money as the primary way to induce behavior. And we know from lots of research that that doesn't work. And while it sounds bizarre to business school, Ignatius had written about this warning. It almost sounds like a, a, a path to success at a business school, and it's riches to honor to pride. Um, and so in Ignatian philosophy, um, rather than that being a way to success, that's actually a way to failure. And a lot of what we teach about is the transition from riches to honors to pride. Um, so what did we do about that? How is it that we... What are the levers that we have when we think about organizational design? Well, I think the first one is whom do we promote? Whom do we hire? How do we reward people? Whom do we reward? Under what circumstances do we reward them? Um, how do we organize them? What messages do we send? How do we discipline people when they do the wrong things? How do we reward them when they do the right things? How do we organize the firm? And it's these, and I don't have answers to these questions, but I think, you know, while it is true that we can focus on individuals all the time. If we go up one level and think about organizations, there are certain kinds of organizations, and it is true that they take the tone from the top, but certain kinds of organizations are probably better able to support people to make responsible decisions, and others less so. How do we find those organizational traits that uh, might help us all in our, in our search to uh, make better decisions? So if we start with individuals, and then we go to organizations, then we go up to the next level, and that next level is, in some sense, systems. And you know, none of us own systems, but how do we affect them? At the school here, some of you who've spent some time here will know that I talk about rules of the game. Rules of the game are the combination of laws and regulations, as well as social norms, that determine, you know, in some sense, the playing field on which we behave, on um, which we act. Um, most of us are not in a position to write rules and laws, nor do we set social norms. Um, having said that, why are they so important and what we, can we do about that? So why are they so important? They, in fact, are the rules. So when we go and play football or soccer or whatever game it is, it's not appropriate to bring a crowbar onto the field and to whack the other player. We all know that that rule isn't one to be obeyed, uh, or, or that, that's not a good, good thing to do. Somebody sets the rules. Um, and those rules, again, some of them are written down and some of them are not written down. And we have at the school people who study laws and regulations. We also have people here at the school who study social norms and we have people who study reputation, which is the embodiment of the social norms. So then what's the role of a business school and a university then in this search for responsibility? We have incredibly powerful platforms. We have convening power. Um, we have alumni, we have uh, a voice that's very strong. It's important for us to be able to identify and kind of nudge norms along wherever we can by, for example, Charles explaining, despite the fact that he's head of the roads, trust. Um, what are the shortcomings of, of the man who in fact you know, allowed so many people to flourish? And what do we learn from that? Um, and so I think it's our job to do all that we can in order to try to get these issues to the fore, and then also to try to highlight organizations and individuals who have done remarkable work, um, as opposed to simply those who have made the most money, which is the norm. Uh, and therefore, it's, um, as a dean of a business school, this is an unusual talk, because you know, we love our donors, and they're remarkably important, but we should celebrate all sorts of folks. Um, and I think celebrating responsible leadership itself today is um, the is embodiment of that. Now, you'll note that I am intentionally short because I'm really just the filler before the next speaker. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to use that as a transition to explaining why we're here and to, to introduce the next person up. So as a dean, one of the things you'd like to do, again, is to set the tone from the top and to focus on things that you think are really important. And you know, no kidding, I spent my Saturday along with asking some of my good friends to spend their Saturdays and hoping that you would all come out because I think that this is a really important thing for us to be talking about. And in thinking about responsible leadership, I had the luxury um, of thinking about who I might like to honor in this time for this series that we're gonna be doing over many years, I hope. And so I personally was thinking about all the people that I'd worked with over the years. Um, I worked in 
consulting and a little bit in architecture and financial services and academia. Uh, and I worked with a tremendous number of great people, people I admire greatly. Um, but I came back to one person, and I said, you know, if I have to name this after somebody, I'd really like to name it after Kim. Now, I was a young professor when I went to Harvard Business School. I guess by definition, that's true. Um, and Kim was a senior professor, and then later on, he became the dean, and I um, worked for him in a variety of, of uh, capacities. Um, and what I saw was somebody who quietly and steadfastly kept us pointed towards true north. Um, making sure that you know, we did the right thing um, quietly and without making a big deal of it. Um, keeping the mission of the organization in front of us at all times, sometimes you know, to our chagrin because each meeting would begin with the mission of the Harvard Business School. Um, I saw somebody who wasn't afraid to take hard decisions. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount. And so it was some great trepidation that I picked the phone one day and asked Kim if he would come to Oxford to be honored by us, despite the fact that this is his first visit to Oxford. Um, and much to my pleasure, he said yes. And it's much to my pleasure that I can introduce you to Kim B. Clark, the, found, the uh, person after whom this uh, fellowship and responsible leadership is named. Kim. Thank you.